Okay. Great. Um, hello, everyone. I'm Jackie Drew, and I'm the president of the World Congress for Physical Therapy, HIV AIDS, um, Oncology, and Hospice and Palliative Care uh, network that is hopefully going to become a subgroup in May and at the World Congress meeting in Geneva. So keep your fingers crossed. We'll keep this information out to you. Um, today, I'm very honored to have Talia Muhammad come and speak for us about uh, stem cell transplants and host versus graft disease. I've known him for about two or more years, and he has this wonderful organization and educational information online that he'll be covering with you today. So I want to welcome Julio and thank him for doing this presentation. And I'm going to turn my camera off and let you continue here. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Jackie, for having me here today. Um, so let me start off with uh, introducing my um, the website and the organization that Jackie was talking about. Um, it's called the uh, Rehabilitation Association for uh, Hematopoietic Cell Transplant. And basically, we founded it uh, around two and a half years back when I got introduced to the uh, this graft versus host disease patients. And uh, before, actually, I never worked with these patients uh, three years back. And when somebody talked to me about this disease, uh, they said about GVHD, I was like, GVH what? And that's the first time I ever heard of it. And as I started reading about it, and because our hospital, they do about 350 allo transplants a year, which is the King Faisal Hospital in uh, Riyadh, where I'm working currently now. And uh, so a lot of patients started uh, getting referred to our department. And uh, after researching about this, this disease itself, the more I read about it, the more I got fascinated. And the more I got fascinated, the more I became passionate about this disease. Because as a physical therapist, working with these patients, it's like the whole uh, box of problems with regards to the MSK uh, in one patient. And as we will explore the complications these patients suffer today, and we will learn that these patients suffer from fascia problems, muscle problems, joint problems, bone problems. And like I said, I became passionate and I started doing research and contacting different societies around the world. And luckily, uh, we were able to partner with WCPT Network for HIV AIDS, Oncology, Hospice and Palliative Care. Jackie was very kind enough to extend her help. I got a lot of help from my own hospital, which is the King Faisal in Riyadh, and uh, ASBMT working parties, EMBT, which is the uh, Eastern Mediterranean, and the EBMT, which is the European Bone Marrow Transplant, and lastly, the International Academy for Clinical Hematology. So this is where we started off. Now, the aim of the today's session is to, first of all, highlight the importance of pre-transplant full body function evaluation in the patients who are due to go for um, transplant and also those patients who haven't had the opportunity to see a physio before transplant, they should still go a full body function evaluation post-transplant. We're going to talk about that. And uh, we're going to talk about the, the muscular skeletal manifestation in coronary graft versus host disease. And, uh, we're going to add a slight different point uh, or different uh, angle to the assessment of these patients because we believe that over the last three years of working with the patients and research that these patients, they need uh, more of my facial chain measurements rather than um, uh, what you say, joint uh, range of motion measurement. But we're going to talk to this about this with a couple of case studies as well. And lastly, earlier this year in January, we produced a paper in the Nature Journal, uh, which is like a combined paper along with the working parties of ASBMT, EMBMT, and EBB, EBMT, which basically producing the guideline for rehabilitation specialists 
working in this field uh, and how to assess them, how to treat them, how to manage them. And in the end, we're going to talk about our future, um, uh, what do you say, um, research projects which we are doing and the ideas which we want to throw out to the to this uh, community working with this patient. Uh, and hopefully we can do some collaborations in the future. Now, talking about us as organizations, so we are like-minded professionals from different backgrounds. We have warmer plasma consultants, we have physical therapists, occupational therapists, respiratory therapists, nurses, speech therapists, and we all came together to form this association. And very quickly, we have had a lot of interest from around the globe, and lots of countries joined us. Now, some of them to name from here is Austria, Australia, Canada, Croatia, Egypt, France, Germany, Italy, uh, Nigeria, Oman, Saudi Arabia, Switzerland, USA, UK, and many more countries. They keep emailing us every uh, week, two weeks, to know about our organizations and how they can collaborate. Uh, I forgot to put the Russia in there because we recently have Russia joined us as well. And uh, so this is how big we have gone over the last two and, a half, two and a half years. So let me start off with the presentation itself now. And please feel free to stop me in the middle or ask me questions. And if I'm going too fast, please let ask me to go slower. If I'm too slow, ask me to go fast or uh, whatever. So let's start off with uh, the importance of pre-transplant full body functional evaluation. Now often, as we all know, working with this patient group, that these patients, they come with a variety of problems um, pre-transplant because of the disease or the drugs they have been on or the time since they had the diagnosis. So from the patient point of view, it is very important that a physical therapist working with pre-transplant or post-transplant patients, that what is the quality of life to the patient? Because many a times what we come across in our clinics is that the patient comes and tells us that, um, that I have had the transplant and I was supposed to be good in six months time. But from the consultant's point of view, what, what the consultant is saying to the patient that they will be good in the six months time, time period, not necessarily mean that he'll be fully functional and running a marathon, something like that, but they, they mean from the disease point of view that you'll be, the disease, disease point of view, it will be less, you'll be recovering well, and stuff like that. Now, for example, the picture, the first picture on this slide here where the patient is kneeling down. But this patient was two years post-transplant, allotransplant. And he didn't realize he had lower limb GVHD until he actually went back to work. And the way he discovered was that he worked as a carpenter. And when he tried to kneel down on the floor, he found he had restriction at the knee, ankle, and the hip level. At first he was puzzled that why he was not able to kneel down because according to him, the transplant went well and everything was going fine and he's not supposed to have any problems. And that's when he reported back to his consultant and then was referred to physical therapy. And when we assessed the patient, again, we're gonna measure, we're gonna, we're gonna talk about the myofascial assessment rather than the joint range of motion assessment because that's how we discovered the myofascial chain restriction rather than the, um, the knee or hip joint uh, restriction. The second picture is of a 14 years old girl who was referred to the clinic uh, for ankle GVHD on her right side, predominantly. And I have got a video of her in the next few slides, which I'm gonna show you her gait pattern. And uh, though what we discovered in her case was that rather than having an ankle GVHD, she actually had a hip pathology 
which is the avascular necrosis of the hip, which we identified during our physical therapy examination and confirmed after the sent her for radiological uh, imaging. And lastly, the girl with the, the brace on her hand, she was in her 20s and worked as an administrator and spent a lot of time typing. And after she had transplants, she developed graft versus host disease in her hand and fingers. And unfortunately, as you have seen, the, the brace which she is wearing in the picture was not designed for optimal gains. And again, this is because of the, to, according to me or to our uh, colleagues who have worked with this disease, is the poor understanding of the myofascial chain and getting confused with the joint range of motion rather than the hand range of motion. But again, we will discuss this case further in the slides to clarify how and why we um, address this in, in, in this way. Now, we advocate a full body functional assessment, either pre-transplant, if we can, for every patient who is awaiting a transplant, or, or for post-transplant, again, a full body assessment, because what we have to understand is these patients are a special group of patients. And the GVHT, which attacks, as we know, because it can attack, attack multiple organs at the same time, so seeing the problem in isolation is not beneficial for the patient or the clinician in the long term. Now, if you look at this video, which we talked about in the last slide, about the 14 years old girl, now, if you walk, if you look at the right leg and the gait pattern, so according to the, the to the, the doctors who referred them to us, they referred them for ankle GVHD because they thought that is what is causing her gait problem. But when we assessed her gait and then we assessed her knee and the hip joint, so we realized that she had a lot of restriction in the hip area and the combined hip knee myofascia. And hence, we referred her for an uh, x-ray, and which came back to show avascular necrosis of the hip. And then this patient was treated for hip problem using uh, strengthening exercise for the hip and gait training, and uh, we also tried a bit of uh, focal shock wave for the hip joint, which again we're going to talk in the later slides about the innovative technology we can use. Um, but that's what the case study here shows that if we are to focus, or if we were to focus only on the ankle, then we would have missed the problem which was apparent in the hip. Now, coming on to the literature review. Um, sorry. So last year, we did a systematic review on the physical therapy and its benefits on the patients undergoing transplant or with the patients with GVSD. Out of the thousands of studies we, uh, or not thousands, I'll say hundreds of studies we identified, we dropped it down to 20, which met our inclusion criteria. Now, nine studies, they were inpatient based only. Eight studies were both inpatient and outpatient. And two, two studies were outpatient, while only one study was pre-transplant. Now, all the studies in their conclusion, in their, in their um, uh, what do you say, um, patient, um, sample. They found that physical therapy, exercises, rehabilitation, they had benefit on the patient's different parameters, including fatigue, hemoglobin, muscle strength, immune cell recovery, and in many cases, psychological well-being, cardiac fitness. So lots and lots of uh, benefits were shown from rehabilitation itself. However, what we found is that most of the studies, they failed 
to acknowledge the the complex nature of the problem and the, how the musculoskeletal manifestation in individual patient can affect the individual outcome with rehabilitation. So which brings on to our this slide, which talks about what are the musculoskeletal manifestation that these patients suffer from and what is the extent of the problem. Now please bear in mind that today we are talking only about the musculoskeletal aspect of the GVHD while these patients can also develop oral GVHD, vaginal GVHD, lung GVHD and other organ GVHDs as well, which, is, which has an added impact on the quality of life and the function performance. So, now starting off with the loss of muscle mass. So this use or deconditioning is one of the side effects which these patients suffer from the, the immuno, immunosuppressive treatments, in particular corticosteroids. And normally what is seen is that the lower extremities, the lower back extensor muscles are more affected than the upper extremity. And this results in the difficulty in ambulation after a prolonged period of rest. So this is one of the, what you call as subjective marker which you can ask the patient. So do you find difficulty to get up from the chair after you sit for the long time? Or patients complaining of low back pain and fatigue in the lower extremities when climbing the stairs might be an indicator that they are suffering from some kind of GBHD or drug-induced problems. The second thing is the prolonged immobility because when they are inpatient, some patients develop complications post-transplant and they are immobile because of reduced hemoglobin or reduced platelets and this results in muscle atrophy. And again, this can cause back pains, this can cause a problem with uh, mobilizing the patient from the bed to walking, etc. Now, keeping in line with the steroids, many patients, they also suffer from steroid-induced myopathies. Now, acute is within one week of high dose of oral corticosteroids and can be associated with rhabdomyolysis and pain which every physiotherapist should be aware of and should be keeping a keen eye on recognizing these kind of uh, symptoms. The chronic can happen over weeks and months of time, and this is usually due to high dosage of steroid administration, and they're generally painless. And muscle weakness, again, in the upper and lower extremities and the neck. And the same point is repeated here as well, the difficulty from rising from the seated position or lifting with utensils to eat. Now I think that sitting up from the chair or from seated position is because of the weak trunk muscles and the lower leg muscles. And this can be again, uh, like mentioned before, an indication for the therapist um, to ask the patients these questions. Now inflammatory myositis. Now muscle, mu muscle mass and strength may also be compromised because of inflammatory myositis. Now inflammatory myositis can also mimic as polymyositis or dermatomyositis. And uh, this is immune mediated result of chronic growth versus host disease. Now often associated with tapering of immunosuppressant medications and also seen associated with some genetic markers which are seen in patients with autoimmune disease who have not undergone hematopoietic central transplant. And typically this presents with pain and symmetric proximal weakness. So you're looking for weaknesses in the hands, fingers, or in the toes, or in the ankle. Now, bone is one of the most common uh, problems which we see in our clinics. And the studies report that as many as 50% of patients who undergo uh, transplant to develop osteopenia or osteoporosis. And the patients who have GVHD, they have higher incidence of that. Hence, again, the importance of full body assessment. Because if somebody is referred to a physical the therapist for hand GVHD, we in our clinics, we do a shoulder assessment, we do an elbow assessment, hip and knee assessment, just to rule out any other 
bony problems which might have the you know which might, which might have been ignored by the patient uh, or because of the other symptoms taking uh, priority for the patient. Now, as we all know that the bone problem is because of multiple corticosteroid is a major risk factor um, and can lead to osteoporosis. The bone density, the loss in point graph osteoporosis is typically seen in more femoral heads than in the vertebra. But we have also seen patients with avascular necrosis of the femoral head in the shoulder as well. Um, I would say maybe two or three out of 100. But it is uh, possible, and we have seen such patients. And again, most of these patients, they get un undiagnosed or underdiagnosed because they only start feeling the pain or the symptoms when their movement is um, significantly restricted. And then that's when they go for investigation and then to find out that they have avascular necrosis of the humeral head in the shoulder. Now, most of the studies have shown that the uh, transplant itself causes a fundamental alteration of the bone and mineral metabolism with loss seen in the first six to 12 months. So that's why, again, in our recommendations, which we're going to talk about in the next few slides, we recommend that any patient who is, who is undergoing a transplant, they should be monitored and seen by the physical therapist up to 18 months. Uh, but depending upon the hospital to the country and you know the clinic where you're working in, um, you can spread out uh, the sessions um, as, as as per your allowance, basically. Now we're going to briefly talk about the myofascial chain uh, using some case studies. That why we are saying that um, these patients require a different kind of assessment than normal physio range of motion assessment. And uh, our association is also currently working on um, a, a research piece, a diagnostic uh, assessment for GVHD patients. Uh, we are starting to standardize the upper limb and lower limb, lower limb um, measurement tools, which I will show you in a, in a minute. Now, just to give an example for the upper limb, this picture I have uh, taken from Trains 2009, uh, which was uh, Thomas Mears. As you can see, the myofascial chain they describe in this picture here starts from the pectoralis, major minor, and then extends towards the biceps into the forearm, going all the way to the thumb. Now, in most of the GVHD, it, the problem is with the fasciitis. And what we have to remember is most often the elbow joint or the wrist joint are not really affected. It's the fascia which is, which is contracted, causing the, causing the motion to reduce. And for many patients, it's a combination of fasciitis and scleroderma, which is the thickening of the skin, which is again causing the problem with the movement. So this is one of the case study here for the myofascial chain measurement. Although we are still using the goniometer, which we use for the joint range of motion, but what we have done is, if you look at the picture on the left side of the, where the fingers are extended, and I, the picture is not really clear, I'm sorry about that. But what it shows is that the range of motion for, for wrist extension with the fingers extended, the patient was only able to perform about 10 to 12 degrees. This patient was having hand GVHD. Now, same patient at the same session, when we close the fingers into flexion, and then we ask him to do a full extension from 10 to 12 degrees, he was able to go up to 50 to 55 degrees of wrist extension which is a massive difference. Now, these patients, if you remember the slide from the, from the, from the past few, which is the, the girl with the um, uh, splint on the hand, now, the reason why we were saying that that splint was not uh, designed for optimal gains is because, now as you have seen in this 
previous picture that the hands, the traditional hand splint it did not consider the myofascial chain of the fingers. So when the splint was put on, the fingers were flexed while the wrist was extended, which means that the whole the whole myofascial chain was not being stretched properly. So along with our occupational health department therapists, we started designing uh, custom-made braces for them. And thanks to our occupational therapist, that they became more and more, um, what do you say, um, um, coming up with different ideas and imaginative, the word is, sorry, more imaginative. And if you can see in this video here, so if you see in this video here, this is not the end product, but this is the crude version of what we're trying to develop for the GVSD patients. Now, we had to use these guitar strings, which was hooked from the forearm. And if you look at the, these fingers, notches here, these are mainly used for uh, trigger finger kind of problems by the occupational therapists or for immobilizing a PIP or DIP joint. So we use this as a hinge to, to create an extension at the finger level and we hooked it to these guitar strings and to this screw over here where you can tune out or tune in the tightness or the stretch you could say on the fascia. So this took care of the, the finger flexion of the myofascial chain. So which means that when we stretch it, it's going to stretch the whole forearm myofascia along with the wrist and the fingers together. And the good thing is the patient himself can adjust this as for the pain tolerance. But again, as I said, this is a working progress. This is not the end product. And we are working on this brace to make it look more beautiful and more uh, user friendly for the patients. Uh, and we're also trying to see if we can add a digital meter in it where we can actually increase the flexion or the extension by degrees on the dial, which will show exactly how much range of motion is being achieved. Okay. So coming on to the, the, the best practice guidelines. So for the last two years, what we have been working with different patients, gaining experiences, talking to the experts from around the world. And we thought, okay, we need a, a, a guideline for the rehabilitation specialists working in this field so that the patients get optimal benefits. Now, although this paper talks about different scenarios, and we do realize that each country has their own um, challenges with regards to working with patients, with regards to the number of sessions they have or the resources they have. But this can act as, a, uh, what do you say, um, uh, something to work on um, with your uh, local authorities or the, the bodies um, at, in your own countries. So what we're suggesting in this uh, paper as a protocol is, in a nutshell, that every patient who is due for a transplant, they should have a full body uh, assessment, which in includes the upper limb range of motion for neck, shoulder, elbow, wrist, and fingers, lower back, hip, knee, and ankle range of motion, okay? And also strength measurement, some of them, depending upon, again, the resources available for the, from the hospitals, you can either use the high-end technology like Primus RS isochronic machine for upper limb and lower limb strength measure, endurance measure, or you can use a, a JAMA grip strength for the hands, and you can use a resistance, uh, 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 like a one, one repetition maximum or three repetition maximum resistance training uh, for uh, weightlifting kind of uh, measurements. But the idea is that you have some kind of basic score 
both on the functionality, which is a range of motion, and on the strength of the patient pre-transplant. So we have something to work on when the patient is admitted and if his condition is deteriorating. So we know where we started and we know what is the base level at least we should reach post-transplant. Now, when the patient is uh, in-house in the hospital as an inpatient, now we highly recommend that these patients get individualized, specific exercise program depending upon their pre-transplant scores. So the pre-transplant scores should be a precursor in designing a program which will best fit for the patient needs. So it is customized and it is for patients' optimal gain. For example, if a patient comes in and we find that pre-transplant scores, the lower limb is weaker because of his history of the uh, drugs which has caused it, then we know that during the inpatient, and again the outpatient as well, that we design a program which takes into account that this patient needs an extensive um, individualized lower limb exercises program. And also please bear in mind that some patients might need the strength training, some patients might need the endurance training. So again, when we are designing the exercise program, we should be very cautious of how we are designing it and how it's going to change the patient's parameters physiologically, how this exercise can change the patient's um, what is performance in the long term. Now, from the inpatient, as the patient is moved on to the outpatient, so the recommendations we have is that these patients see the physiotherapist for outpatient rehab for up to six months. Now, this depends upon the individual patient, uh, hospital policy, resources, uh, but again, it's more important we think that it is to spread out the sessions if we have limited over the six months rather than finish the whole six in one month. Because what we have to realize is in the transplant patients and GVSDs, the symptoms develop over months and months of time. And so we need to be monitoring these patients. So if you have only three or four sessions allocated by your hospital for these patients, so you can use it wisely by assessing them on the first day, giving them home program, maybe seeing them like every four weekly or five weekly basis to see the progress and to monitor any signs of GVHD or complications. And this is what we do uh, in our hospital at the King Faisal. We also have like a GVHD clinic where we monitor the patients. Like we book them every four weeks or five weeks. We do again a full body. Uh, assessment. Now, because we already have the, the measurements from the pre-transplant, so any changes in the range of motion, the function, the performance is easy to monitor from the from the last scores. Now, we're going to talk about the return to work plan in our next slide anyway, but this is one of the most important things that the physical therapists and the other healthcare professionals should be involved in is the patient's return to work. Now, these patients should be monitored over six months, 12 months, 15 to 18 months, if your hospital or your clinic allows you to do so. Because the, from the literature, what we understand is these patients can have complications up to two years post-transplant. And what we don't want to do is that we don't want these patients to develop complications which they're not aware of, and they're only seen when the complications have gone extremely um, bad and develop into contractures, and that's when the patient is seeking medical help. If some patients you feel that they're doing very good after the transplant, what we do is that we give them a home program, we educate them about the signs and symptoms of graft versus host disease, and what to monitor on the day-to-day -day life, and then we can discharge them and safely. And if the patient finds any problems in the functionality, and has, as he's monitoring his own condition, then he will come back to the physical therapist where we give him a point of contact number. Now with regards to the return to work, now in some countries I know that the physical therapists are already involved 
in return to work decision making with the patient, with the employers, and with the medical team. And in the perfect world, this should be the scenario for uh, all the patients who are undergoing transplant and who want to go back to work. That the physical therapist does a full functional capacity evaluation, which is called the FCE, which is basically evidence-based objective measures, which identifies the patient capacity or incapacity in doing a certain job, which means that the physical therapist, in some cases, in some countries which we know of, he himself goes to the patient um, job area where he is expected to return back to work. So he does a job evaluation of what are the functional um, movements which are involved to do to carry out this job. And based on that knowledge, then he assesses, assesses the patient's functional capacity where he identifies what the patient can and can't do. And then he matches the job against the patient's individual functional capacity. Now, the good thing in this kind of scenario is that, that the physical therapist is always liaising with the patient and with the employers that this patient can do this kind of job and this kind of movements or this kind of load can he, he can lift um, safely. And the patient and the employer feels confident in working towards getting the patient back to work. There's also an element of psychological identification as well, where the, the physical therapist finds if the patient has any yellow flags or the blue flags, which uh, mainly deals with the, the fear of movement or fear of going back to work, and he tries to uh, deal with it, or he might get um, referred, he might get the patient referred to experts who deal with these problems like cognitive behavioral therapy or psychologist and so on. So the job evaluation we already covered where with the therapist is forming the idea of what the patient is going back to work. And many a times you will find that these patients in their best interest, it might not be good for them to go back to work as, as a full-time job straight away on a certain um, or certain lines. So the physical therapist, they can liaise with the doctors, the medical team, and the employer, and advise them that this patient can go to work, but let's start with a phased or modified return to work, which means that we are loading the patient's capacity slowly but gradually, giving time for the patient to get back into the work, adapt to the work challenges, the modifications of the work, the load of the work, and gradually settle down in the work and increase the duties gradually. Now this graduation depends upon individual patient, his medical circumstances, his functional capacity, and obviously the patient's own psychological status as well. So it's a big undertaking. So again, it can only be done uh, when the hospitals they have this kind of resources available uh, to provide to the patients uh, in their, in the, uh, for their best uh, interest. So that was about the, the protocol uh, which we developed this year and it's already been published. Now coming on to the, the future project. So like I mentioned uh, in the couple of slides earlier that the exercises should be designed for each patient individually to answer his problem. Now again, the systematic review which we've which we done, which has not been published yet, is that we found that out of this, the 20 articles which we identified, only three articles or the three studies, they had some kind of scientific rationale behind prescribing the exercises to the patient with meaningful gains in the sense that they explained in the paper that why they are doing for what they are doing. And I think we need to encourage more and more of these kind of studies where which will help clinicians like us determine which exercises at which patient groups are working well and why they are working well. So we define exercises in a more better way for optimal gains of the patient. Now the other thing which we are trying to work on is use of artificial intelligence 
for um, identification of early signs of graft versus host disease uh, for symptoms like fasciitis, scleroderma, or maybe also a vascular necrosis of the hip. Um, but here's something we are working on. It's still on its infancy stages uh, because we are a small organization. We lack resources. Uh, so we're trying to combine it with different societies to see how we can uh, collaborate and work on this. But the idea is that we we uh, make something wearable, which the patients uh, could wear post-transplant, and it will be, um, what do you say, talking to um, the um, satellite remotely, sending data. So basically scanning the area and we'd see it could be an ultrasound scan or a different kind of scan, and which will send the data and we can monitor the changes which are happening within the tissue or the bone level and hence trigger an uh, appointment for the patient if there are any symptoms of fasciitis, scleroderma, or bony changes in the patient. Um, same way, we're also thinking about in those patients who have a vascular necrosis of the hip or the shoulder, we are thinking of uh, maybe making something like a low intensity uh, pulsed ultrasound, uh, which has which has known for um, uh, bone healing uh, properties, same as for shockwave. And uh, the shockwave, as we know, it has been used in diabetic patients for wound healing and cardiology, uh, patients with angina for, for growth of new blood vessels, and urology for chronic pelvic pain syndrome and erectile dysfunction. Um, so we were thinking that why can't we use this technology for our patients in GVHD? Because these machines are already nice, nice uh, approved, FDA approved as well for certain conditions. So maybe it's a matter of exploring uh, whether if these technologies can be useful for our patient groups as well. And one of the case studies I came across was 2016 was this uh, the study on 43 patients, which is 86 hips, with the early signs of uh, osteonecrosis of the femoral head in adult uh, after leukemia. Who, who had uh, allo transplant, and they gave them shockwave between 500 to 1,000 pulses, and each treatment was one week apart. And uh, the patients were advised to walk partial weight bearing on the affected leg for four to six weeks, uh, which I didn't understand why would they do that because the weight bearing should enhance more healing but uh, I'm sure they have their own reasons for that. But they had very, very good results actually, very promising. And uh, so they, these patients who had glucocorticoid-induced necrosis of femoral head, um, they showed that the patient, as you can see from this, from this uh, MRI uh, pictures A, B, and C, that A was a pre-treatment and six months was B and the 12 months was uh, C. And uh, it shows decrease in the lesions of the shockwave and no changes in disease staging or evidence of further collapse of the femoral head. So again, this kind of studies are very promising for us that there's something else in our toolbox which perhaps we could offer to the patients. But I think more and more studies or high quality randomized trials are required to be able to uh, incorporate this in our routine clinical practice. Same thing with the ultrasounds. Patients who are already suffering from uh, vascular necrosis of the bone. Um, so they have a lot of studies on the, the LIPAS, which is the low intensity ultrasound therapy, on how it can stimulate the mast cells, the platelets, the white cells, phagocytic roles, the macrophages, and uh, stimulates the fibroblast and the cellular cells. And as you can see on the screen, I managed to get a Google search uh, on the scholar, and lots of articles are talking about healing of the bone fractures and stuff like that. But I have not come across any studies which have 
used this technology for avascular necrosis uh, of the bone uh, post transplant. So we were thinking that can we use like a wearable device which a patient can wear, uh, which will be constantly administering the, the lipus into the bone and monitor the patients over 12 months or 18 months of time to see if, if that has any uh, benefit to the patients or not. Now imagine if the the whole if the, if the ultrasound does what we are uh, hypothesizing with regards to the tissue healing and stuff. So maybe maybe it will also help to manage fasciitis and scleroderma from the initial early stages of diagnosis, and perhaps in the future we can develop like a whole body ultrasound chamber where a patient can go in the chamber, have the whole ultrasound radiation to the, all the tissues in the body, considering that the GVSD can affect the whole upper limb and lower limb and the back and the neck, and maybe it will have some kind of therapeutic effect. So again, these are all theories which we are uh, trying to see, uh, is there any potential for research uh, in these kind of areas for the patients. So lastly, before I go away, this is the email address we have, uh, which is ask at cgvhd.co.uk, and our website is cgvhd.co.uk, where we have a lot of information about uh, the disease itself, and if I can just go through some of the stuff we have on the website for the clinicians. Um, So if you go on the CGVHD website and on the transplant page here, under the rehabilitation and transplant, so we have this section here where you can actually download the functional evaluation which we are trying to encourage different, uh, different uh, um, hospitals to use. This is going to be our uh, new project which we are working on. So again, these are all based on our patient experiences and expert opinions where we have produced this um, assessment procedure which considers the myofascial chain rather than the joint range of motion. And it, it describes the pictures, how to measure it, and how to monitor it as well. So we have one for the upper limb, and there is one for the lower limb as well. And the website and the materials are free to access. There is no, um, uh, what do you say, um, uh, copyrights or anything like that. It's free for everyone to use. Um, I think with this, guess my time is up. It's already uh, 48 minutes done. Um, I'll just finish off with uh, uh, directing you to this website here, which is our upcoming event. So the website is rehabhsct.co.uk, and this is our upcoming symposium. It's an international symposium, a symposium on the stem cell and the organ transplant, which is due to be in, in UK, in Kent, on the 19th and 20th of October, 2019. And we are calling for abstracts as well. The website will go live from the 1st of March where you can access and you can register from this, for the symposium here um, to this page here. Um, so that's me, I guess. Thank you for your attention. And any questions, I'm happy to answer. Um, this is Jan. I just wanted you to know that um, if people have questions, you can ask questions either using your microphone or to okay. the chat line. Um, okay. So if anyone has a question and you'd like to type it into the chat line so Leo can see it um, up on the chat line. Or um, if you unmute your microphone, you can have direct access and speak to, to Leo. So if anyone has any questions, um, he's here to take your questions now. If, if you have questions, he's provided his website for you. Yeah. Um, 
Also, those who are listening to it after the session in the recording, they can also email me as well. Yes. Um, Julio, while we're waiting to see if there's any other questions, I do have a, a comment about the ultrasound. Um, yeah. I, I used to teach the modalities courses at two different universities in Michigan, and um, ultrasound work, you know, as the evidence supports for bone healing, but one of the issues with deep in the hip is that we're not so sure we can get the sound waves that deep into the tissues and the structures. Yes. And um, another uh, component that came out was also using like a ten uh, electrical yes. stimulation through the joint because there was. Yes. Okay, so do you want to comment on that, please? Uh, look, please, please, please go ahead because I, I haven't thought about tens yet. No, please. Oh, okay. Well, my only comment is that maybe um, your group could look up some articles and see about. Um, putting the TENS unit over the joint and seeing if the current would go through it because there was some evidence, this was several years ago, that um, the, the TENS was good for uh, non-healing hip fractures in elderly people. Good. So that might be another... Uh, Fantastic. Yeah, if the ultrasound, and, and hopefully the ultrasound can be positioned in some way that it would go deeper, but it's usually the muscle tissue that, you know, in the water yeah. that it so, so, um so we were thinking of uh, if, if if we can uh, you know um, collaborate with one of the surgeons uh -huh. and get like an implant. Um, but I don't know. I mean, this is again a very far-fetched idea. Yeah. Um, but we're working with uh, with all orthopedic surgeons as well to see. What are the other options we have? Okay, great. Um, there is one question online from Scott Caposa, and he said thank you for the presentation. He asked, which type of uh, stem cell transplant puts the patient at most risk for GVHD from uh, allogenic bone marrow or allogeneic uh, peripheral blood? Uh, so mainly, mainly we see um, uh, what's it, the allo from from the uh, not from the from the blood. Okay. Yeah. Okay. There's another comment from uh, Dino Chengbo. Dino Chengbo is our director of education in the uh, World Congress of Physical Therapy, um, uh, Oncology, HIV AIDS, and Hospice and Palliative Care subgroup, and she said. Um, um, thank you, Julia. Uh, the presentation was wonderful. Um, and also, uh, Nina will be sending you um, a certificate that's a, a, a small award that, that we give you. It's recognizing you as an international scholar, so she'll be sending that paper out to you, you know, in the next day or two. Thank you very much. Yes, we, this was a wonderful presentation. Um, any other thank comments you. on the chat line or anyone else here to speak? Okay. Well, if there are no further comments, um, I want to thank you wholeheartedly again, Khalil. Your group has done such amazing things in such a short time to advance this area of practice. And, and I think one of the... Go ahead. Hello. Hello. Yeah, this is, uh, this is Emmanuel, Emmanuel Tanu. I'm calling from Nigeria. I, uh, um, here, here in Africa, we have uh, so much level of HIV AIDS. So I want to know if the knowledge you have in this particular kind of condition could be used to manage patients with uh, HIV AIDS, especially with the one with the uh, ultrasound. Thank you. Um, with regards to HIV and AIDS, to be honest, uh, I'm not the best person to answer this question. Um, so I don't deal with these patients to be honest. Maybe one person you could contact is Darren Brown. He's out of the UK and he's um, our, our uh, coordinator for HIV AIDS within the WCPT IPT Hope. So if you go to our website, um, now his uh, contact information is listed on the website, and his name again is Darren Brown, and um, he would have better information about whether some of these um, modalities could be used with HIV/AIDS patients, and you know what the precautions would be. I'm sorry, I can't answer your question.
question either right now. Thank you. You are expert. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Thank you for the question. We have about five more minutes. If anyone else would like to ask a question. Okay, well, um, this uh, presentation will be placed on our website, the WPPT IPT HOPE uh, for, again, HIV AIDS, oncology, and hospice and palliative care. So if you want to read, watch the presentation, or if you want to send it to your colleagues, I send a lot of these to my colleagues because they're so high quality. And um, I, I think the thing I appreciate the most of your presentation, Jaleel, is yeah. Your, your group is recognizing the complex nature of oncology and oncology problems and particularly, you know, stem cell transplant, but we can't just treat, you know, a, a, a shoulder that's, um, yeah. you know, uh, frozen because of uh, breast cancer treatment because they have all kinds of issues with cardiac overlay and autonomic yeah. nervous system and bowel and bladder and myofascial problems. So I, I think it's important that people treating cancer patients recognize the comprehensive damage that's done because of so many of these medications and the cancer itself. And even though the big problems are easy to see, you know, your yes. presentation is pointing out how we as professionals who look at these issues with the body are the ones that can recognize that, you know, like the yes. study with the woman with the ankle, the child with the ankle where it was yes. her hip. So, yes. It's very much appreciated. Yeah, thank you very much. Well, I want to thank you, Jackie, for all your help and support given to us during all these years, and Nina as well. And uh, without you, it's difficult to move forward. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, Tony. Excellent presentation. So um, I will wish everybody uh, have a great day, and I hope wherever you are, the weather is good. And um, um, this again will be on our website. Thank you again, Julio. This was just excellent. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Have a good day. Yes. Goodbye. Goodbye, everyone. Goodbye.